I started out the 9 o'clock service by saying that Brenton did all the audio for that using only his mouth, no instruments. And then I felt real bad for lying to everybody, so I don't want <laughs> to start that way. That's not how you should start a sermon. Hey, we're going to sit together and lie. We're not. I promise we're not. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to study God's Word. And real easy passage today, super simple. You'll probably fall asleep. Uh, Daniel chapter 7. Those of you who know Daniel chapter 7 know that I'm lying right there. (laughs) This is a tough one, okay? This is a really, really tough passage, a very sobering passage. And hopefully by the time we get to the end, we're going to recognize the great truth that God wins, that Jesus is king, that's fantastic, and that we should have a real burden for telling people about Jesus because there's some tough stuff that we're going to encounter today for sure. So grab your Bibles, join me, Daniel chapter 7. You remember a couple weeks ago we walked through the first part of Daniel where Daniel had this dream, and today we're going to get the interpretation of of that dream and Daniel's response to it and Daniel's talking to an angel and there's some wild stuff going on here but if you're familiar with your Bible if you read your Bible a bunch you understand this is a way God communicates with people is through dreams through visions we seem to kind of discount that a little bit in the church in the west I think in developing countries you still hear a lot about things like that I don't know that we hear about it as much here and I don't know why 100 percent some of it could be that everybody owns a Bible. Some of it could be there's a church on literally every corner. I I get that part, but I don't want to put anything past God. If this is how God wants to communicate, he's God and he can do it. So we we discount dreams, but but sometimes we do because the dreams are foolish or, you know, know, it's hard to interpret sometimes. I I heard about a guy and he told all his buddies growing up, he goes, I have a dream that I want to be a millionaire by the time I'm 30. And so he told his buddies, like, I'm halfway there now. And they're like, oh, really? He goes, yeah, I'm 30. I don't think that's the way to interpret that dream. We wouldn't pay a lot of attention to that. I'm telling you now, we're going to want to pay a lot of attention to this dream, okay? Because at the end of it, we're going to see this is actually a revelation from God to Daniel. And so we're going to jump in. We're going to see the interpretation from an angel. We're going to see Daniel's reaction. Join me. If you have your outline, it's there. If you have a Bible with you, that's great. If not, you can follow along on the screens. But Daniel chapter 7, verse 15. As for me, Daniel, my spirit within me was anxious, and the visions of my head alarmed me. Now, up to this point in time in our study, Daniel's been this guy just with super confidence, right? he's, He's been that guy who's got a lot of composure, and here he's really shaken by this dream. And do you remember what the dream was? Daniel's looking out over the sea of humanity, and out of the sea emerged these four beasts, one after the other, and they were all kind of weird. The first was an Iglion, do you remember which you guys seem to like better than legal, which was my term for the lion eagle, but eagle on one in the survey. Uh, but, but it was a, a beast that had wings like an eagle, but it was like a lion. And then a second beast came out. It was like a bear. A third came. It was like a leopard. And then this fourth beast comes, and it's just crazy. It's different from the other beast. It's more terrifying than the other beasts. And this beast had ten horns. And then from the ten horns, a little horn sprouted out, and it uprooted three of the horns. And this little horn, as if this couldn't get wilder, had the eyes of a man, and it had a mouth that was uttering boastful things. So this is a wild dream, right? This is pretty crazy. Daniel has more. The vision continues. He sees the Ancient of Days. We said that was God the Father sitting on the throne. He's opening books. He's judging the nations. And at that time, God judged this final beast. God judged this little horn and threw him into the lake of fire. So I wish we could just stop here and we'd all celebrate. God wins. Uh, Daniel saw Jesus. That part's great. He said he saw one as the son of man coming to the ancient of days. And Jesus was given this glorious eternal kingdom. And I remember the very first time I read this, like really read it. I think I'd read Daniel before as a Christ follower. But I, I went to seminary and I read this. And you get to the end of the passage and you're like, well, this is great. God wins, right? Why is Daniel so worried? I just kind of focused on the happy ending, and and I didn't understand why Daniel was so freaked out. But as we study this, we're going to see the reason I believe he's so concerned. 
It's a great old Mark Twain quote that I love, being a Missouri boy. And Mark Twain said, it's not the things that I don't understand in the Bible that bother me. It's the things I do understand. Because <laughs> there's a whole lot of tough things in the Bible. Am I truly going to pray for those who persecute me? Am I going to bless them? Am I going to be a friend to sinners? Am I going to die to myself? These are hard, hard things. I understand them perfectly. They're just hard to do. So it turns out I don't think Daniel is stressed because he doesn't understand this vision. No, I think he's Mark Twain. I think he has trouble or th with these things that he does understand. What's the, what are they going to mean leading up to this kingdom of Christ? It's going to be hard, right? And so I believe this dream is kind of a huge wake-up call for us in the church today. I hope we're awake. Look at verse 16. I approached one of those who stood there and asked him the truth concerning all of this. Now, this is pretty wild, and we've got to remind ourselves, who is Daniel talking to? Well, if you remember at the, the dream part back in verse 10, Daniel said there were thousands upon thousands standing around the throne of God. Now, this is where you can always get in a little trouble assuming, but, but I think this is a pretty safe assumption. In Daniel's vision of heaven, he sees thousands and thousands of angels standing around. And so he goes to talk to one of these angels to get the interpretation of the dream. And if you had a chance to talk to an angel, would you ask questions? Daniel does, verse 16. So the angel told me, and he made known to me, here was Daniel's question, what does this dream mean? What are the interpretation of the things? And earlier on, we'd said Daniel had been given from God a spirit to be able to understand dreams and visions. And so when other people, when King Nebuchadnezzar had a dream, he goes to Daniel, and Daniel can kind of figure that out. I don't know if he doesn't really know what this dream is about, or if he goes and has this interaction with the angel for us today. So this ends up recorded in God's word so we can study it. But either way, he says, I'm, I'm going to need a little help. And the angel gives it to him. Gives him a general interpretation that we'll see first, and then a more specific interpretation. Let's look at the general one, starting verse 17. It says, these four beasts are four kings who shall arise out of the earth. Now, we've already covered this, and we said those four kings kind of represent four kingdoms back in history. And it was Babylon and Medo-Persia and Greece and Rome. But here is something that's kind of neat, and I always love to point these things out. The text says they arise from the earth. And here's where people who just want to tear down the Bible and criticize the Bible will say, well, see, there's a contradiction in the Bible. Because back in Daniel chapter 7, verse 3, it said they arise from the sea. And here in verse 17, it says they arise from the earth. So there's a contradiction. You can just throw the whole Bible out. Stuff like that is really frustrating to me. Because <laughs> if you're going to make a comment like that, you're ignoring the complete context of this passage. Verse 3 was Daniel's dream. Verse 17 is the actual interpretation of the dream. And we already said it's not like Daniel was sitting on the shores of the Mediterranean Sea literally watching beasts emerge from the sea, right? We said that was a picture of humanity. That was a picture of all mankind, the sea of humanity. So actually, we understand that these people didn't live in Atlantis. They weren't all underwater dwellers. That These are beasts that arise from the earth because they represent people. They're nations. And so again, if you want to pick at the Bible, you're going to have to be a little stronger than that, I think. This is not a contradiction at all. Back to the general interpretation, verse 18. I love this. But the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever and ever. So what's going to follow those four kingdoms we've been talking about? Well, it's Jesus' kingdom. And we saw that back in verse 13 and 14. But what's really interesting here is that we get introduced to a new cast of characters here. I almost expect the angel to say, well, then God's kingdom will come. But he doesn't say that. He says the saints of the Most High will have this kingdom. Well, who are the saints of the Most High? It's you and me. This is us. That's who he's talking about. He's talking about Christ followers throughout history. He says, we're going to receive this kingdom and possess it forever. Verse 14 says, Jesus will be given this kingdom. What's he going to do with it? He's going to share it with his followers. That is such great news that Daniel actually revisits that. He repeats it back in, in verse 27. He says this, And the kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High. So I hope there's lots of stuff we learned today. If it's only one thing, make it this. If we're Christ followers, we're going to rule and reign with Christ, and that is good news. It's so good that Daniel reminds us here, actually through the Holy Spirit, Paul tells his disciple Timothy about it, and it makes it into Scripture. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 12 said, If we endure, we will also reign with him. What do we call this? This is a solid promise from the Bible. 
And so in Daniel's revelation, in, in these other four kingdoms that we learn about, what's happening to God's people during that time? They're all being subdued, right? They're being ruled over. Well, in the final kingdom, God's people are going to be the ones who rule. And that's the very general interpretation. I almost wish we could stop there because it gets really wild here. <laughs> Let's do the specific interpretation. Daniel wants to know three things specifically. First, he has a question about the fourth beast. Look at verse 19. Then I desired to know the truth about the fourth beast, which was different from all the rest, exceedingly terrifying with its teeth of iron, its claws of bronze, and which devoured and broke in pieces and stamped what was left with his feet. Daniel wants to know about, more about that fourth beast. He also wants to know more about the ten horns, verse 20, and about the ten horns that were on its head. And the third specific question from Daniel is about this little horn. He says, tell me about the other horn that came up before which three of them fell, this horn that had eyes and a mouth that spoke great things and that seemed greater than its companions. Now, when we're reading this passage, these are probably the three questions that we have as well, right? We're tracking with this. And so before the angel can interpret this, Daniel kind of shares some of the activities of this little horn. And this little horn goes by another name that we'll see in Revelation. We've probably heard this before. It's the Antichrist. It's the picture of the false Christ. Verse 21 and 22. As I looked, this horn made war with the saints and prevailed over them until the Ancient of Days came and judgment was given for the saints of the Most High and the time came when the saints possessed the kingdom. So I hope you grabbed an outline coming in. Those are Daniel's three questions and we're going to see the angel addresses them in that same order. Specifically, look at verse 23. Talking about this fourth beast. The angel said, as for the fourth beast... There shall be a fourth kingdom on earth, which shall be different from all the kingdoms, and it shall devour the earth and trample it down and break it into pieces. And we've already talked about this a little bit. The, the fourth beast is the Roman Empire. How is it different from the three previous empires? Well, those were really king-centric, right? Like when you talk about Babylon, you talk about King Nebuchadnezzar. When you talk about Medo-Persia, you talk about Darius and Cyrus. When you talk about Greece, you always talk about Alexander. Rome was not that way, right? It wasn't king-centric. The thing that was most outstanding about Rome was how cruel they were, just how they would devour and crush and trample to come into power. And so we get that. They're different. Well, then Daniel has this second question about the ten horns. Look at the angel's answer. Start of verse 24. As for the ten horns out of this kingdom, ten kings shall arise. And we've talked about this a little bit already. And if you remember, we cheated and we looked in the back of the book. We went to Revelation <laughs> to get some more information on this because I believe these 10 horns that are mentioned in the future are going to be this 10 kingdom confederacy. And a lot of really wise theologians believe it's going to actually be kind of a revival of the Roman Empire. And I think there's some really solid evidence for that and we'll consider it in a minute. But, but you got to remember that confederacy was future in Daniel's day. And it's still future in our day, right? It, it falls in the what comes next category. But I still think it's going to be helpful for us to study it today and correlate some scripture to confirm what's going on in Daniel. So if you like to follow along in your Bible, flip to Revelation, and we'll look there as well. But if not, we'll have this on the screen. But, but here's what you see in Revelation. Six centuries after this revelation that God gave Daniel that we're studying today, the apostle John received another revelation from God. And it says this, Revelation chapter 13, verse 1. John says, I saw a beast rising out of the sea with ten horns and seven heads, with ten diadems on its horns and blasphemous names on its heads. And the beast that I saw was like a leopard. Its feet were like a bear's. Its mouth was like a lion's mouth. Are we going to sleep okay tonight? This is scary. It's wild, but it should sound familiar, right? John gets this vision of the beast, and it's kind of like a leopard, but it's not really a leopard. It's got the paws of a bear, but it's not really a bear. It's ferocious. It's got a mouth like a lion's mouth, but I'm pretty sure this is supposed to remind us of those first three kingdoms from Daniel's dream. And if you remember, we said this a couple weeks ago. Each of those kingdoms, like when that kingdom was defeated, there were customs and traditions that were carried on to the next kingdom. So they kind of had an extension of time granted. But this fourth kingdom, it says, is going to be different. And here we see in Revelation, this beast is going to have seven heads and ten horns. Now, praise the Lord. What's that all about? Revelation chapter 17 helps us understand a bunch. If you flip over there, it's talking about a great harlot who is riding on a beast. 
Now, in my understanding, this great harlot is the false church, okay? It's not God's church. It's not the one true church. And we kind of get this. God's church is described as what? A virgin bride. And so this false church is the opposite of that. Opposite of that. It's a great harlot. Now, all this starts to play into our understanding of the timing of events that are going to occur around something called the tribulation. And that's something, I'm just giving the teaser here. We're going to get into that in a lot more detail later on. But my belief, personally, anybody who holds a pre-tribulational view of the timing of the rapture of God's church, and that's a term you've probably heard as well, the rapture when God comes and literally takes Christ's followers out of this mess and we get spared the wrath that we're going to read about today. So, so when that happens, we're going to read more about that later. But, but after the rapture happens and, and God's true church is gone, what will be left behind is going to be this false church. It's this false church religious system, and they're going to offer worthless worship. And so here in Revelation, they're represented by a harlot, okay? And if you don't know what that word means, lean over and ask your parents. Don't send that in midpoint. We don't want to hear. I'm not going to answer that question in our podcast, so ask them. But, but here in Revelation 17, this false religious system teams up with the beast. They're partners together during the time of tribulation. And Revelation 17, 9 gives us an explanation of the beast. It says, this calls for mine with wisdom. You ready for this? The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman is seated. So stick with me here. So seven heads are seven mountains, which again, a lot of really discerning theologians believe this is a re reference to the seven mountains of Rome. There are seven mountains over there. If you Google this, which I, I would suggest you do, Google calls them the seven hills of Rome, but don't get me started because we live at the base of what should be the Lewiston Mountain and what have all you call it, you know. Yeah. So, so, so they, by dictionary definition, meet the terms, they're mountains, but they're called hills. And there's seven of those in Rome, Aventine Hill, Caelian Hill, Capitoline Hill, Esquiline Hill, Palatine Hill, Quirinal Hill, and Viminal Hill. Now, this information, along with another thing we're going to see here in a minute, is why a lot of scholars believe this event that God is showing, what he's telling John about, it's going to take place in Rome. And it's going to be kind of a revival of the Roman Empire. But, but the explanation continues, verse 10. says, these seven mountains are also seven kings, five of whom have fallen. One is, and the other has not yet come. And when he does come, he must remain only a little while. We still together? <laughs> Do we need to stand up, take a break, stretch a little bit? It says there's seven kings, and those are represented by these seven hills. Now, I would contend these seven kings here reference the seven kings that we can look at in history who have subdued God's people, the nation of Israel. There have been seven kingdoms held God's people in subjection. And we can work backward. The text says the, the five have fallen. Who are those five? Well, what was the first kingdom to discipline God's people. It was Egypt, right? Moses led his people, God's people, in the exodus out of Egypt. What was the next kingdom? It was Assyria. Assyria is the kingdom that actually took the 12, 10 tribes of Israelites captive. And, and then we know the third, fourth, and fifth. We've already seen them. It's Babylon, it's Medo-Persia, it's Greece. So it says five kings have fallen. It says one is. Now you've got to remember... John's getting this revelation 600 years after Daniel. So when John's writing this information down, it's 95 AD, who's in charge right then? It's the Roman Empire. That would be the sixth kingdom, right? He says one is, and then five have fallen, check. One is, check. The angel says one is not yet come. Now, who is that kingdom? Look at Revelation 17, verse 12. And the ten horns that you saw are ten kings, this ten kingdom confederacy we're talking about, who have not yet received royal power, but they are to receive authority as kings for one hour together with the beast. Now, here's why I pray this starts kind of coming together for us, okay? It says five kings have fallen. The sixth is, it's Rome. The seventh kingdom is yet to come. It's this ten kingdom alliance that's going to be in the future. It was way, way in the future in Daniel's day. It's way in the future in John's day. It's still in the future in our day. We're just not sure how far in the future. But anytime we're studying, especially biblical prophecy, and we're asking these questions about what comes next, 
This is where the Bible is so helpful. There are events, there are things that we're going to see take place in human history that have to happen before Jesus comes back to establish his kingdom here on earth, right? None of the Bible prophecy is going to make much sense unless the nation people are returning to is Israel. And if you're aware of your history, there's a period in time when Israel kind of didn't exist or wasn't called by that name. And so it was a really big deal back in 1948 when that happened. Israel was once again recognized as a nation. Now, of course, that has caused the conflict and the things you see going on in the world right now with Israel and Palestine. And, and it's why people like myself, people who are dispensational, who hold to a literal interpretation of the Bible like I do, we're all very, very pro-Israel. Because we see things happening with Israel that talk about Jesus coming back. And so, again, we're not anti-other areas. We're pro-Israel. Now, now, here's what I would say. That there's one thing that you see in that. That had to happen. The other thing that's going to have to happen and there's several other things we'll talk about. But, but this, it's going to be the revival of maybe the Roman Empire or this Ten Kingdom Alliance. Now, here's where I don't want to stray too far from God's Word because that's why we come to church. We're trying to hear from God, not from me. But, but a lot of theologians believe what is happening actually right now with the European Union. I don't know how many people are aware of even what's going on with that. But, but when you look at that, they think this European Union might actually become this Ten Kingdom Confederacy. And I, could, I can buy that. I truly can. And, and on paper, you're like, well, they've got 27 members right now. Well, yeah, but I mean, like, up until 2016, they had 28 members. And then, if you remember Brexit, uh, the UK pulled out, and so now they're down to 27. When they started in 1950, they only had six members. There are 10 nations waiting to join the EU right now. So there's a lot of movement, right? And so the idea that the EU could become this 10-kingdom alliance, I could see that happening. I don't think that's too far-fetched. But here's what I will say about this. I don't place 100% confidence in the role of the European Union at all. What I place confidence in is biblical prophecy. <laughs> and so I believe that when the Antichrist rises into power, there's going to be some kind of 10-kingdom alliance. And I'll just say this, is where that's happening right now, the land they're sitting on, is where the Roman Empire was, okay? <laughs> and that's just all I'll say. That might mean something. Back to Daniel chapter 7, things we can know. The third thing the angel is going to respond to, and I've already given this one away, it's this little horn from Daniel's dream. So let's look at the rest of this. Verse 24. And another horn shall arise after them. He shall be different from the former ones, and he shall put down three kings. So how's this little horn going to be different from the other horns? Well, if you grabbed your outline, there's four things I think that we can see that are really distinct about the little horn. And again, I can't prove some of these, but, but I think as we study, you see these. I think he might be politically powerful. And with that, I think he may command some military might. I think he'll be an excellent economist, and I think he's going to receive worthless religious worship from the false church. And again, what we really see from the Antichrist, the little horn, is he's power hungry. He just wants to take everybody's power. And that's why the text says he uproots three other horns. Now, I don't know that that's going to be a thing where he literally wages war and, and goes violently and takes somebody over. That could be gradual, okay? That, that could be like you think about how an adult tooth comes in and it pushes your baby teeth out of the way. That's not a violent act. That happens over time, right? That may be the way this works. The Antichrist might show up and be unassuming, and then something happens, and he's going to gain more power. And again, we don't have a bunch of time to look at this, but if you look back in verse 8, it says he's a little horn. By the time we get here today to verse 20, it says the little horn seemed greater than the others. Not necessarily larger, but greater, right? So maybe he's just growing in authority. How does someone grow in authority? And this is just, I mean, in America, we'd get that picture where you run for mayor, and you win, and then you run for governor, and you win, and then you run for Congress, and you win, and then you run for president. And the next thing you know, we have all this authority, right? So I don't know, but it could be something like that, just expanding his authority. In Revelation 17 and verse 13, we see this statement about the ten kings. It says, these are of one mind, and they hand over their power and authority to the beast. So that's what we know. This little beast is, little beast, this little horn is power hungry. First, he takes out three kings. Eventually, he controls all of them. How does he do it? He's a smooth talker. And we see that. He's the only horn with a mouth, right? And again, I can't prove this one, but, but this, I, I hadn't thought about that until this week 
I found this really interesting. In Revelation chapter 13 and verse 15, there's where we learn, and it was allowed to give breath to the image of the beast so that the image of the beast might even speak and might cause those who could, would not worship the image of the beast to be slain. Now, is this crazy or 600 years ago, 2,000 years before now, did we see John actually predicting the big screen TV and computers and laptops and tablets and our phones where we see all these images that speak? It's not the real person, right? It's an image of that person. But we see the image given a speech and it's trying to dupe the public or, or get them to cough up money or, or hand over authority or whatever. So maybe the Antichrist won't be a politician, but, but I think he may have to then be an entertainer or a sports star or somebody with a huge audience, right? This little horn's going to have a mouth and it's going to have eyes. And it says the eyes will be keen. The Antichrist is going to be observant. And with these eyes, he'll have insight to solve problems. And again, this is the one where I'm thinking, this guy's going to be a politician, right? <laughs> because I think, and, I, and this sounds bad, but, but, but I, I think politicians will sometimes lie to people. To <laughs> crazy, I know. <laughs> to try to influence and get things to move in the direction they want. Did you hear about the politician? He went to go visit a, a village like in Uganda or Ecuador or whatever. Like that, and, and he takes a delegation and they go to this little village and a spokesman comes out for the village and talking to the politician. And, and they're like, we have two huge problems, two enormous problems in our village. And the politician says, how can I help? And, and the spokesman says, well, the, the first thing is we have a medical facility and we have supplies. We just don't have any doctors. And the politician says, I can fix that. And he pulls out his cell phone and he starts yammering at somebody. And like a minute or two, he hangs up and he's like, problem solved. Because you're going to have a doctor here in two days. He says, what's your second problem? And the spokesman says, we have absolutely no cell service. Not saying all politicians lie. <laughs> I'm just saying I think the Antichrist could be a politician. Now, here's my, here's my big reason for thinking this, okay? I, I can actually get this one out of Scripture. Hey, we'll, we'll see this in just a, a few weeks when we get to Daniel chapter 9. One of the very first things that the Antichrist is going to do is described there in Daniel 9. It says he's going to broker a covenant with Israel. He's going to accomplish something that no politician before has been able to accomplish. He's going to broker peace in the Middle East. So again, I think there may be some political power as part of this deal for the little horn. I could be wrong about that. But, but I know that he's going to be power hungry. And then what we see in the text, he may have control of some kind of military might. And I think we kind of get this earlier. We saw this whole kingdom is going to devour the whole earth. It's going to crush it. Well, Revelation 13, 4 tells us this. During the tribulation, people will say this out loud. Who is like the beast and who can fight against it? A couple verses later, we get this. Also, this beast was allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them. And authority was given it over every tribe and people and language and nation. So it sounds like this little horn's going to have authority, and some of that sounds like it might be military might, right? Again, th these are things that we see. Might be a politician, might be brokering deals no one can accomplish, might be devouring nations through war to the point where he becomes a dictator, one of the other things we're going to see in Scripture, he's going to be an excellent economist. And we'll see more of this in our study as we walk through. But in Revelation chapter 18, we learn that the Antichrist is going to come up with this worldwide economic system. And Revelation 13 tells us it's going to be a cashless system. And many of us have already heard about this, right? We, we get this. In the future, you won't pay for stuff with cash. You won't even pay for stuff with a credit card or a debit card or on your phone. You'll have a chip, a microchip most likely, embedded somewhere in your body. Not we, but people at that time, right? And, and, and that technology is already here. We know about that. I love it when it helps me find my lost dog. I don't like it so much here, right? Because there's a dark side to this economic plan. And it's all part of the Antichrist ploy to ensure loyalty. Because to get that chip implanted, which you will need to buy food, to be able to get transportation, you're going to have to worship the little horn. And it will be absolutely worthless worship. Because it won't be worship of the one true God. It's going to be people bowing down to a pseudo-Christ. This is Satan's attempt to promote a phony Christ. And Satan is such a liar and he's so insidious, God's word tells us something that's going to happen with this counterfeit Christ. This is Revelation chapter 13, verse 3. One of its heads seemed to have a mortal wound, but its mortal wound was healed. 
And the whole earth marveled as they followed the beast. What does that remind us of? That's a false resurrection. That's pretending he died and then coming back to life. And what's going to happen next? And remember, true Christ followers do not have to fear this at all. I believe God's church will be gone because of the rapture. But for those who are left on earth, what happens next? Look at verse 8. And all who dwell on earth will worship it. Everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of life of the lamb who was slain. Now we do have to understand, and this gives me some comfort and some tribulation. But during that time of tribulation, there are going to be people on this earth who come and place their faith in Jesus. But that time of tribulation is going to be horrific. People are either going to be forced to worship the beast or die. And this is so sad to me because we understand in this time that we live now, the the time that God has placed us here on this earth, we're supposed to go out and tell people about Jesus, right? And one of the things we use to share the gospel is the story of Christ's death and burial and resurrection. Now, I don't know if you've ever shared that with somebody, but I mean, I've done it and had people mock me and say, well, people don't die and come back to life. That's just ridiculous, right? Well, you know, there's going to be a time in the future when a guy is going to fake his resurrection. It's not going to be a real resurrection. He's going to fake it, and people are going to eat it up. And bow down and worship this counterfeit Christ. We've had cult leaders in the world today. You're aware of that, right? This is the ultimate cult leader right here, the Antichrist. Back to our text, look at verse 25 of Daniel 7. The little horn shall speak words against the Most High. After showing up and demanding worship on the earth, the the little horn, the Antichrist, is going to start trash-talking God. This is Daniel chapter 11, verse 36. And the king shall do as he wills. He shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every lowercase g God and shall speak astonishing things against the capital G God of God. And we can correlate this in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Paul, through the Holy Spirit, tells us that at the midpoint of the tribulation, the time between the tribulation and the great tribulation, and we're going to talk a lot more about that down the road, but at the midpoint there, this little horn literally is going to take his seat. He's going to sit on a throne and display himself as God, and people are going to buy it. And people will worship the Antichrist. And this is one of the reasons I'm very confident the church will not be around at this time because I don't think it would happen. I pray the church would stand up like Jesus' disciples stood up when they had the opportunity to recant Christ's resurrection and, and say, hey, you know, if it's a lie, you could just, you know, tell us here and, and no, those guys died because it wasn't a lie. Let's press on. The rest of verse 25. The angel tells Daniel, the Antichrist shall wear out the saints of the Most High. So those brand new believers who place their faith in Christ during the tribulation, they are in for it. They're in for a tough time. Because when they refuse to bow down, they're going to suffer. They're going to be the ones dying. This is a fulfillment of a verse we see in Zechariah chapter 13, verse 8. In the whole land, declares the Lord, two-thirds shall be cut off and perish, and one-third shall be left alive. Do you see why Daniel was so concerned about the dream? During the tribulation, two out of every three people are going to die. They're going to suffer the consequences for not offering this worthless worship to the beast. Verse 25 continues. The little horn shall think to change the times and the law. I don't know how that's going to look, but, but under the Antichrist, leadership will potentially change the time. Change the law. I, I, again, I'm not 100% sure on this, but I, I think the Antichrist would want to change the calendar, would want to change the way we record time, because how is that recorded? That's A.D., that's Anno Domini, the year of our Lord. He's not going to want that at all. Or maybe that means he's going to get rid of the, the holidays where we celebrate Christ. We're going to get rid of Easter and Christmas, and they'll be replaced with holidays that, that pay worship to him. I'm, I don't know what that's going to look like. It says he'll consider changing the time. And the law. And that doesn't mean there won't be any more robbery or jaywalking. I think that means God's moral law. For all this time where if God has said this is good, he's going to say, no, that's bad. For all the times where God said that's bad, the Antichrist is going to say, no, that's good. It's going to be opposite day all over again. This is what we're seeing because because this power hungry, this 
counterfeit Jesus might have political power, probably will have military power, will be an excellent economist, and will receive worthless worship. That's sobering. That's why Daniel was so freaked out by this vision. Now, here's where we get some very welcome news. And as we read events like this in prophecy, we, we, we're looking, well, gosh, if a false god could achieve that kind of power, what would take him out? I bet he'd rule for a very long time. No. Praise the Lord, no. Look at the last part of verse 25. They shall be given into his hand for a time, times, and half a time. And what does that mean? If you go back to Daniel chapter 4, do you remember we talked about Nebuchadnezzar having to live out in the field? And he did that for how long? Seven years. Well, the text there says seven periods of time is the Aramaic word idon. It literally means a year. And so Daniel's talking about time here. So he says it's time. That's one year times. That's two years and half a time. That's half a year. So you add those up. There's a period of three and a half years. You don't have to take my word for this. You can correlate scripture. Revelation 13, five, more information about the little horn. The beast was given a mouth, uttering haughty and blasphemous words, and it was allowed to exercise authority for how long? 42 months. We can do that math in our heads, right? <laughs> That's three and a half years. So scripture tells us that the, the saints of that day, they're going to be given into the Antichrist's hands for three and a half years. Now again, when we get to Daniel chapter 9, we're going to see a future time of seven years that's going to come over Israel. Well, that time, that seven years, that's the length of the entire period of the tribulation. So what we're looking at here is half of that time period. It's the span of time, and a lot of us are familiar with this reference in Matthew 24, where Jesus talks about the great tribulation, right? That's what we're talking about here. So let me explain. No, let me sum up. For the first 42 months of the tribulation, the little horn's going to look like a peacemaker. I think the little horn will come up and be unassuming, and it'll broker this great covenant with Israel and look fantastic. In the last 42 months, the Antichrist is going to be a persecutor of the people at that time who placed their faith in Jesus. So that is what's coming. That's what comes next at some point in the future. Now, praise the Lord, what happens after that three-and-a-half-year period of the Great Tribulation? Verse 26, but the court shall sit in judgment and the little horn's dominion shall be taken away to be consumed and destroyed at the end. Praise the Lord. At that point in time, God's going to set up his court. He's going to judge the nations. And immediately at that moment, the little horn's going to get his. Boom, he's going to be destroyed. He's going to be over, right? There's going to be no remnant coming along. There's no followers. It says his dominion will be taken away. Because what comes next, verse 27, and the kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High. That's when Christ's kingdom shall be an everlasting kingdom and all dominions shall serve and obey him. Do you wonder why we take this time to focus on what comes next? Because this is the good news. Amen. Jesus Christ is coming. And even more good news, we're going to rule and reign with him. Verse 28, here's the end of the matter. As for me, Daniel, my thoughts greatly alarmed me, and my color changed. He says, but I kept the matter in my heart. So Daniel processes the angel's response here, and it freaks him out so much, he does his impression of Belshazzar. Do you remember back in Daniel chapter 4 with the writing on the wall, and he turned to the whiter shade of pale? Same thing happens to Daniel here. He's that troubled. Now, church, this is the reality for us. This is what's going to happen as we study prophecy. Sometimes knowing the next thing that's coming brings us great peace, brings us great clarity. Sometimes knowing the next thing that's coming scares the bejeebers out of you, right? That's the way this works. You have to take the good with the bad. It's the bitter with the sweet, right? So here we learn news of this great comfort. Jesus wins. His followers will rule and reign with him. But then we learn news of this great sorrow. Before that happens, there's going to be violence and bloodshed and suffering, bitter and sweet. We're guaranteed God's ultimate victory, but, but it's bitter, it's sobering, because there's going to be many, many people who do not profess faith in Jesus, and they're going to be separated from God for eternity. That's sobering. And that's what causes Daniel's reaction here in verse 28, he's just acknowledging the bitter with the sweet. 
He's aware that with all this grim news about the Antichrist, I mean, for those of us in the room who are Christ followers, for those watching online, if we've already professed faith, we don't have to be alarmed for ourselves. But do we know somebody? Do we have children? Do we have a spouse? Do we have family members? Do we have friends? Do we have coworkers who don't know Jesus? We're going to spend the rest of the time until Jesus comes back looking forward to eternity. That's sweet. But for those who don't know Jesus, this prophecy is bitter because it's telling us what comes next for this planet. Now, church, please hear me on this, okay? Are we going to wake up? Will that bitterness motivate us to go out and make disciples? Will that bitterness motivate us to go out and tell other people about Jesus? Not that we can save them. That's not our role. Oh, how I wish that was our role sometimes. Do you have somebody you love and you'd love to just take the biggest Bible you have and just wonk them over the head and drag them to the foot of Christ? I mean, wouldn't that be great? We can't do that. What can we do? Be the ambassadors. Be the witnesses God wants us to be. Go tell people about Jesus because he can save them. Amen. He's plenty powerful. Let's get motivated. God bless you guys. I sure do love you. Thanks for studying with us. Let's pray. Daddy, thank you for this passage. This, this is a tough one. But if we view this, if we consider it the way I, I believe Daniel did when you gave the revelation to him, it should be sobering to us. Yes, I'm, I'm excited about an eternity with you. I truly am. But, but I know folks who, I don't see hearts the way you do, but I know folks who, I, I don't see fruit in their lives. I believe they may not know you. So does this motivate us enough to go share? God, help us, please, to be your ambassadors in this world. We love you and praise you. And we ask all that in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks so much for listening. If you would like to give to our ministry, please check out our website at lewistonocc.org. And don't forget to like, follow, and subscribe to this podcast, as well as our YouTube channel. You can also follow us on Facebook and Instagram so you're always up to date with what's going on here at Orchards Community Church. Take care and God bless.